Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When the pandemic first began back in March of 2021, we were all filled with fear and disbelief. How could something like this happen in our contemporary world? We had taken for granted what we thought were the near limitless capacities of modern medicine. You know, the, fan- the pandemic forever shattered that illusion and changed our lives forever. One of the most difficult things for many of us to accept was the loss of the ability to worship together in person in our beloved sanctuaries. We all know the church isn't a building, but rather the people who worship in that space. Yet there's something about these spaces that feels holy and appropriate for the strange words and rituals of Christian worship. We are often surrounded by hewn stones that remind us of the ancientness of our faith, of stained glass windows that envelop us in the stories of our faith, and the names and artwork of our fellow church members from generations past that assure us that we are not the first to rejoice or struggle or hope in this place. These spaces, however inanimate, reverberate with the songs and prayers of countless saints who have gone before us in the journey of life. When we worship in them, we feel time and space collapse and the unity of the communion of all those who have gone before us and even those who will come after us. Those comforting feelings lift us into a deep awareness of the presence of God. What do we do, though, when it isn't possible to gather in those spaces to gather? That has been the challenge that has faced us for almost two years now as this pandemic has raged on, sickening countless members of the human family and taking far too many lives. For some in the church across the world, they've gathered in these holy spaces regardless of the caution and concern of public health officials. To them, it's just far too hard to forsake these spaces and the community that is created in them. For others, they have given up church entirely, deciding that there are better ways to spend an hour or so on Sunday mornings. The rest of us, though, the struggle to hold on to the best parts of our tradition while seeking to keep the most vulnerable safe among us, has taken its toll. We have accepted the insights of science, and we are trusting that better days are still ahead of us. Italy was the hardest hit among the Western nations in those first days of this plague especially the northern regions of that beautiful nation. The government there ordered a strict lockdown that included the closure of all churches and houses of worship. And that was especially hard for many Christians, therefore it was the middle of Lent with Holy Week and Easter, the highest holidays of the Christian year, appearing to be effectively canceled. There was one priest in the town of Robiano who decided that he wanted to have some semblance of the presence of his congregation at Holy Week and Easter services. Father Giuseppe Corbari printed pictures of each of his parishioners from their directory and social media profiles and taped each of the pictures to the seats in the sanctuary of Saints Corinico and Galetta Church. He was careful, mind you, to place them in the same spots normally occupied by those parishioners. He later chuckled as he told a reporter. A photo of an empty nave, a nave empty of people, save for Father Corbari, 
and those hundreds of photos became one of the most memorable images from those difficult days. It spoke to our reality, but it also became a powerful symbol of hope and connection. Even without the physical presence of the faithful, I am in communion with the church, said Kerbari. When I pray, I pray feeling the presence of the parishioners, and so I pray with them and for them. The good Father's words speak to us of the truth we celebrate on all saints, and to which the scriptures we heard read today testify. No matter the distances and difficulties that separate us, no matter the power of disease and death, the bonds that are forged in creation and renewed in our baptism are eternal. Across all time and space, we are united with the whole human family, and our lives are interwoven with those of every disciple of Jesus who has ever walked this journey of faith. Isaiah knew that truth even thousands of years before Jesus. And to a people devastated by years of war, disease, and exile, Isaiah sought to cast a vision of the world God is creating in, through, and among all who recognize their interdependence with all of creation. The prophet paints a beautiful picture of the renewal of the world when all people will flock to the mountain of God's presence and be gathered at the endless table of God. They will celebrate the healing of the world with the richest and most succulent foods and wines available, and there will be no end to the bounty. All threat of suffering and death will forever be banished from the world. The writer of Revelation knew that image from Isaiah's words and saw it renewed in a vision given in the midst of difficult days in the early church when many were walking away from the church because of outside pressures in Roman society. The sage looked forward to a future when all suffering and death would be banished from creation and the home of the eternal and everlasting one would be established among the peoples of the world. God would be with the people and the people would be with God. No more would chasms separate heaven and earth for earth will have been made one with heaven in a glorious marriage enveloping all of creation. God, the beginning and the end will have the last word and that word is is life. Jesus, too, knew that to be the inescapable destiny of the world, and so proclaimed and embodied it in his teaching and life. The disciples who thought that suffering and death, separation and pain were the hard realities of life, to them Jesus countered that injustice and death will have no place in the beloved community of God's reign. Instead, the kingdom of God is an already here yet not fully established reality in which the bonds that connect us to each other and the deepest desires for justice and peace and love cannot be destroyed. That's the truth that Jesus proclaims in sharing the grief of Mary and Martha over the death of their brother and his beloved friend Lazarus. Jesus, John tells us that Jesus literally wept with pain over the death of his friend and the heartache experienced by the two sisters. Jesus is so moved with emotion that he demands that the stone sealing the tomb be removed and calls for Lazarus to come out of that grave. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus' own resurrection and ours as well. We have no idea the mechanics or details of any of it, only that in these verses Jesus proclaims power over death itself. No more will the specter of suffering and separation hold its strong sway over those who place their trust in the power of God at work in love incarnate. All of us have known the pain of Mary and Martha, pain they felt in those awful hours after their brother's death. 
Jesus' words and actions only make us yearn all the more passionately for God to do something to restore our loved ones to us. If then, why not now? Yet the truth that Jesus proclaims in word and deed is that our grief and our loss have moved the very maker of heaven and earth, the eternal and everlasting one. God shares our struggles and our sorrows, and God is with us in our pain. The one who made each of us in the divine image shares every sorrow we endure and yet also promises that the bonds that unite us to those we love can never be broken. Father Karbari's words remind us of that powerful truth Though we may be physically separated from our loved ones, we are yet united with them through love, a force that not even death itself could defeat. Each time we gather with family and friends to celebrate a meal and tell stories, every time we glance at a photograph and remember, even when we sit with our grief and our tears, the love that spans all time and space, uniting us once more with those we have loved and lost, binds us once more to them. When we gather as a community of disciples around this holy table, offering simple gifts of grain and grape, and remembering the power and presence of the one who shares our hurts and our hopes, who walked this pilgrim road with us and for us, we join our prayers with all those who have gone before us in welcoming the presence of love itself, which tears away the veil between life and death, collapsing time and space and uniting us with all those of every time and place who have shared our faith and our life, giving us a foretaste of the great banquet to come in the fullness of God's reign, when we shall all feast together with all of our loved ones at that table without end whose bounty cannot be exhausted. It is in this hope that we remember and that we live. Amen.